Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. If you like this video, please give me a like down below. And go ahead and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you didn't like this video, please leave me a comment below as far as what I can do better. I'm always looking to improve. Today we're going to be looking at Atomic Twister, a movie where a nuclear power plant gets struck by a tornado. The story centers around the plant's control room staff. So this is going to be a multi-part series as I will have a lot to say about this. <laughs> this movie is from 2002, which is after both Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. So training and oversight of the nuclear industry were heavily upgraded, we'll say. So I have much higher expectations for the competency of the control room staff in this movie compared to, say, the China Syndrome. So there's your first shot of the plant. Uh, looks like uh, two cooling towers, um, about similar amount of buildings that are consistent with having two uh, reactors. I don't see the reactor containment buildings, but they're possibly on the other side, or maybe they're hidden behind some of those squares or something. But this is the only shot that you see of the actual facility. Um, and they got a little creek going through. Uh, note that some plants actually use a river or a massive reservoir as their uh, cooling source. Those hyperbolic cooling towers are synonymous with nuclear power, but they're actually just as common in um, oil and gas fired uh, power plants. So uh, keep that in mind. All right, it looks like we have a suspended fuel assembly over the spent fuel pool with nobody even watching the lift. If this assembly was used fuel, you would have irradiated anyone in the room. <laughs> and you'd be getting a lot of dose from those, uh, from those fission products. Um, irradiated, irradiated fuel assemblies, though, are completely safe when underwater as the water actually absorbs a lot of the uh, dose and of course a lot of the heat. It, water is very good at absorbing heat from the uh, from the radioactive decay that continues to give off heat long after the uh, reactor is shut down. You could even jump into a spent fuel pool and be fine. It'll be a bit like jumping into a hot tub. It's typically about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's hope this is a new fuel assembly, one that hasn't been irradiated yet um, plants will receive new fuel assemblies to get prepared for the next refueling outage. So let's just hope it's that case so um, <laughs> nobody's getting dosed. Either way though, having a suspended load just swinging back and forth like that is dangerous no matter what industry you're in. Gonna eat him alive. Father, he's a grown man. You don't understand men well. Twelve years. That scene right there is part of their control room and office setup, and I have to say, it does look a lot more modern than what you actually see in a real nuclear power plant. This is what you see in a real nuclear power plant. Yeah, it looks pretty ancient. Other thing I will point out about that scene is... They had a weird number showing at the top. 836 megawatts. That is a weird number. Um, so nuclear plants, you want to stay at 100% power. Uh, they're what's known as base load utilities. 100% power was 3,852 megawatts thermal or about 1,400 megawatts electric. So 852 is weird. Um, either this is a smaller plant or they're sitting at a weird power level after coming up from a refueling outage, possibly waiting on some secondary plant equipment. So um, that's just weird. Also, there are references in this movie that I'll show later that implies that there's two reactors and two separate control rooms, but only one is seen through this entire movie, such as having those uh, two cooling towers, like I mentioned earlier. Now this could be a brand new power plant where there is no fuel in the reactor in, this, in the second reactor, so you wouldn't need anybody yet. 
Um, either way, it doesn't come up in the movie. What's a meltdown? <sighs> the term meltdown refers to the fuel rods in the reactor that they overheat and melt. But we have backup system after backup system, so that doesn't happen. And even if it does, which it won't, but if it does, the reactor is in containment, which means just that. We can seal it up like a tomb. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. That's actually not a bad explanation, um, though a plant operator giving a tour to Boy Scouts is not an ideal choice, and plants do actually have PR specialists that are designed to do this sort of thing. The term meltdown is not a real industry term. Terms like fuel damage or core damage are used instead. It's not. It's as powerful as the sun. But if you just left these things out exposed, I mean, <laughs> sunblock don't help if you don't have any skin. Oh my god. And that is why you have <laughs> PR experts. He should say there are similar backup systems to cool the spent fuel pool to keep the fuel and everyone safe, which there are. Also, that in the background, that is a weird location for a spent fuel pool. It looks like it's in the turbine building or some building that's exposed to atmosphere. It should be in a confined and radiological controlled area, not in any spot that can leak to atmosphere. And no, Boy Scouts wouldn't actually get to see that part of the plant. Help if you don't have any skin, you know what I mean? Yeah, anyway, so this is where we store them. Uh, look before we getting. can move them to safe and protective story, storage. How long is that? Uh, about 20 years. How long did they have to be in that protective storage you take them to? About, uh, uh three to four hundred thousand years. <laughs> oh man, the looks he got from those Boy Scouts. Again, he is saying some facts, but not from a position of confidence. So the fuel cools off in the pool where they're... After they're in the pool for a while, they are transitioned to dry cast storage. Here's a little diagram of one. You can see how many layers they are protected. Here's what it looks like out on, on site on a pad. These things are really cool. They're super tough. They weigh over 100 tons and are shielded from all types of radiation. They can even withstand extreme weather, such as tornadoes and hurricanes. They've actually been tested um, with uh, people shooting missiles at them, <laughs> and they've survived. These things are immensely tough. I actually didn't trust you. Why did they bring in someone for that job, man? That should have been yours. It wasn't fair. It's called affirmative action, Potter. They wanted a woman for the job. Oh, that awkward moment when you say something bad about your boss. Wow, he's sexist. Uh, one of my previous jobs was a shift supervisor, just like the main character, um, Corinne, who you will meet in a moment. I've enjoyed working with several successful female shift supervisors and other leadership uh, roles throughout the uh, nuclear industry. So, yeah, I'll debunk that right there. Um, also, he should have seen it coming, as shift supervisors have a big difference in, qual in qualifications. A shift supervisor needs a senior reactor operator license, which requires about two years of intense training, written exams, simulator scenarios, and nuclear regulatory commission evaluations. It's a bit like getting a master's degree. So they should have known that she was in the pipeline for the job, and this wouldn't be an outside hire or even really a transfer. A license is unique to the specific site. It's unclear, but implied that this guy, um, a reactor operator or a head operator, um, doesn't have those qualifications. Reactor operators are required to get a license as well through a similarly long process. It's just a different license as there's no management uh, component to their training. You can upgrade from reactor operator to senior reactor operator, but it still takes about a year. You 
You cannot possibly be checking those systems that fast. <laughs> oh, that's that's silly. Uh, so a reactor operator is required to walk down the control board several times a shift and take written logs on critical parameters such as reactor coolant system pressure and temperature um, dur during their shift and to use both their board and uh, computer indications. So him just fumbling through computers like that, no, that's not going to thing. And these logs are actually serious. Uh, they're part of the reactor's... Uh, technical specifications to perform these logs within that frequency and technical specifications are in agreement between the nuclear plant and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. Failure to adhere to those tech specs is a violation of federal law and can result in civil or criminal charges. Another thing I want to bring up is staffing. Those four characters, um, Corinne, the shift supervisor, Potter, the, norm the nervous operator we saw earlier, um, Gail, who we'll see later, and the uh, sexist head operator guy, are the only people we see, as far as control room staff, the entire movie. A real skeleton crew for a, even a one-unit site would be two SROs, uh, the shift supervisor and a technical advisor that's designed to help you with uh, accidents, um, two reactor operators, and at least one plant operator per, per building. So you know, a lot of it, it's usually four or five, depending on the site. And a plant operator, um, they're not licensed, but they are still very rigorously trained and go through an intense uh, qualification process. And that's just operations. Maintenance would have their supervisor, two craftspersons from each trade, mechanical, electrical, and controls. And there would also be a radiation protection technician to do dose assessments and a uh, water chemistry technician to, uh, to take samples. The bare minimum operation staff per NRC regulatory requirements for one control room would be one SRO, one RO, and three plant operators. And that's no bathroom breaks for 12 hours kind of a situation. And since there are no plant operators, uh, these guys seem to be somewhat hybrids in this movie. They would be subject to yet another NRC violation. <laughs> They are not off to a good start, and the twister hasn't even gotten here yet. Can't tell if they got the tornado watch. Cell phones down? Yeah, cell phones won't go through the concrete. That's the sheriff's department wondering if the uh, nuclear plant got a tornado watch. Uh, surprising, the tornado is coming. <laughs> Yeah, the nuclear plant would have actually gotten it around the same time that they did, if not even earlier. Competent plant management would have seen the severe weather being forecasted days earlier, and uh, they would have prepared in advance by directing their plant operators to clean up debris at the site or anything that could just be a hazard in case of extreme weather. Um, they would also enter a specific procedure for Tornado Watch, which directs a lot of those activities. That's funny because the movie's called Atomic Twister and they're playing Twister. Hello? Hi, sweetie. It's me. Just checking in. How are things going? Campbell? The loss of one above ground phone line would not kill the phones at a nuclear plant. They're typically buried lines. Well, anyway, time to enter the loss of communications procedure. This has you check um, other landlines, uh, satellite phones, microwave phones, radios, um, emergency response lines, and about 10 other ways that the nuclear plant should communicate to the offsite world. They should be fine right now, all things considered. I to see if I can get a signal on my cell. What about the satellite phone? We only use the satellite uplink for stage one alert. Neville, take over while I'm gone. Wow. Okay, first off, the shift supervisor should not be the one to go out and try to fumble with her cell phone from 2002 to try to get a signal. Use one of the many backups I talked about. 
But as you're going to see, this design of a plan is not nearly as robust as a real one. Also, you don't need to be in a stage one alert, which sounds like an emergency plan level of some type. That's not what it's actually called, by the way. Uh, level one in a real emergency plan is called an unusual event, and alert is level two. The loss of communications procedure is has you test all of your backup equipment because you don't want to be in an emergency to have to rely on said backup equipment. It's just simply not a conservative decision. At least she told someone to cover for her while she stepped out, but unless he's an SRO, he's not really supposed to be able to cover for her. He wouldn't be qualified to do so. Anyway. But yeah, it is really not looking good for these guys. Do you think this crew would even be able to survive the incoming Twister? We'll find out next time in part two of my <laughs> reaction video for Atomic Twister, where we get to see their emergency response. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.